From the campus studios of Saarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Hello, Ropecast listeners, and welcome to another episode dealing with English gardens. So in the studio with me today, once more, is my friend Peter. And um, Peter, I think today we should mention that the 19th century was not just a period of standardization and new technology, but towards the end of the century, there was a movement called Arts and Crafts, which really was a, a powerful reaction to all of this vic Victorian ideas of standardizing. Well, and a reaction to industrialization, yes. because those people, they seem to have had the right ideas back to traditional ways of producing and doing things, including arts. So how different, then, were gardens under the influence of arts and crafts? Well, as far as patterning in carpeting and things like those in Victorian times were concerned, they got rid of all that, and more independence was being used, and uh, they were more creative than in the past. They did not stick to formulas, to models, and so on. It was their own invention that became a thing of great importance. Moving now towards the 20th century, um, after Victoria's death, we have what we call the Edwardian period, leading up to the First World War. And there are one or two very important names which are still mentioned today, aren't there? Uh, Gertrude Jekyll? Yeah, it's Gertrude Jekyll, who was an elderly lady when she first met a man who was about 30 years younger than she, but they got very well on together, and it was Lutyens, Edwin Lutyens, an architect. Well, and she was not a gardener, she was someone who was very much involved in embroidery, in painting, and things like those, and when doctors told her that, uh, well, there was a risk for her of going blind, well, she understood that painting and such things were out of the question, and at the age of about four fifty, she turned to gardening, and she was the person who really uh, led to perfection what had been started in, or what was also done in arts and crafts movement. So, what would um, um, a garden under her influence look like? Well, we can we can say that they are fairly natural to use to use uh, this way, and the idea that was prevalent towards the end of the nineteenth century of, of having gardens which looked very much like tapestry. Really, it's uh, it's uh, absolutely artificial, and this is something that was abandoned by her. And I think she gave uh, her ideas of using more independence, more freedom, uh, to hundreds of gardens throughout. The world and this was completed by the by the work of the architect who well who introduced some kind of formality to the informality that was created by Gertrude Zekiel. Right. And in the twentieth century um there were fewer really wealthy people with their large estates, uh, often because of death duties, the, these were broken up. So we get many more small-scale gardens, leading to the sort of, well, suburban garden that you find with many British houses today. And huge variety, huge variety of planting, but also a variety of um, architecture. And I think this is well illustrated in um, the annual Chelsea Flower Show. Well, the annual, uh, well, the Chelsea Flower Show is what it is called a show. That is to say, what you can, what you can see there, what you can admire there is something for the really rich and wealthy people and the gardens, the show gardens that can be seen there sometimes are sold for hundreds of thousands of pounds to wealthy people throughout the world. Now, the, of course, the Chelsea Flower Show is the annual, the major annual show by the RHS. Well, the Royal Horticultural Society. Why is it called Royal? Originally, it was a horticultural society starting at, at the beginning of the 19th century. 
with an educational purpose. Industrialization had taken its toll, and the idea really was to allow people to get back to nature to a certain extent, to learn how to produce their own food, how to raise animals, and the first show that was held in the center of London, well, there were donkeys, there were cows, there <laughs> were sheep, there was everything. It was basically very, very educational. And throughout the years with their shows, they ran into an enormous deficit. And it was Edward the seventh it was, I think, Dirty Bertie they call him, or was it the eighth? <laughs> I think it was Ed well, Edward the seventh it was, of course. So the son, the the Prince of Wales, who became king after Victoria uh, had died, and he gave money to this society to help it to survive. And since the beginning of the 20th century, it is called the Royal Horticultural Society. I think for uh, people visiting the UK, another important organisation would be the National Garden Scheme? NGS. Yes. Well, this is, this is a typically British thing. And um, I, I doubt it very much that countries like France, Germany, Luxembourg, European countries would be able to, well, to have something or to introduce something, even if they wanted to, something like that. It all started back in the 19th century when a wealthy Liverpool, Liverpudlian businessman uh, needed help for his mother, who, uh, well, had to be cared for. And when his mother died, the person who had been in charge of his mother, well, this person was employed by him to look after other people in need in the Liverpool uh, area. This is how it started. And this wealthy man had a garden of his own, and he allowed people to visit his garden, and he had to pay something like a penny. Well, from simple beginnings in the middle of the 19th century, it has become a nationwide movement. There are more than 3,000 gardens in, in the United Kingdom these days, which are open for charity and on specific days throughout the years. But a telephone call does it all. If you want to visit such a garden, you ring those people up and they will open it for you. They will offer coffee and tea and cake and you pay your five, four or ten pounds and all this goes to charities. The other organization I think we should mention before we finish is um, the National Trust. Well this is a completely different story because that was something that started in 1895 when three men quite simply looked at what was going on in the United Kingdom and they noticed that beautiful manor houses were decaying and the land landscape, generally speaking, the coastline was endangered and they started, uh, well, raising funds to buy threatened properties. Well, again, this has become a powerful movement supported by the government and uh, above all in the 60s and 70s, they profited from, well, from laws that taxed uh, um, um, inheritance uh, very well, quite highly, up to 90%. Yes. And in those days, lots of manor houses and huge properties, well, changed hands and became the property of the National Trust and are open to the public. Although, of course, you have to pay a fee to visit these places. Um, but many hundreds of places around the country, in the National Trust for Scotland, in a very similar way. Exactly. And as far as the United Kingdom is concerned, I mean, after Brexit, there's a lot of talk about the situation of farming in the United Kingdom. Well, the biggest farm in the United Kingdom is the National Trust. I think it's quite remarkable, too, that you have a population of 60-something million, four million of them are in membership of the National Trust. And on top of that, there is the, the, there are those hundreds and thousands of volunteers oh, yes. who, um, well, who are available for all kinds of jobs, looking after properties and being there when people visit banner houses and so on. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for giving us these insights into British culture. And that's all we have time for today. So goodbye, listeners. You've been listening to Ropecast, brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. 
Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial. Thank you.